welcome everyone. Um, I am Betsy Pilon, Executive Director of Hope for HIE, and I am joined today on um, our Medical Advisory Board Educational Series uh, brought to you by our um, partner Medtronic um, with Jennifer Cages, who is um, our board uh, chair of professional and family outreach and um, also by Sue Hall, who is on our medical advisory board and has um, a ton of insight to bring to the topic today, which is mental health after the NICU. Welcome, Sue. Um, if you could just give us a little bit of your background, um, you can articulate it much better than I can, <laughs> and then we'll get started. Okay, I'm Dr. Sue Hall. I have been a neonatologist for 30 years. And before I was a neonatologist, I was a social worker. So that has informed throughout my career, um, my interest in communicating with parents and supporting parents. Um, I've worked with the National Perinatal Association for many years on the topic of uh, providing psychosocial support to NICU parents. And we've published widely on that topic. And now we have an educational course for providers on that topic and wherever we have the opportunity to spread the word about how important it is to support NICU parents, uh, we're there to do that. So I'm happy to be invited here today. Thank you. Wonderful. We're so glad that you could join us. Um, and as I guess the rules will go as we go through, we're gonna talk about some topics. For those of you joining us, if you have questions that come up, uh, feel free to write them in the chat. And um, if we don't get the, you know, to them in one section, we might wait to address it in the next. Um, we'll try to let you know where we're going as we go through this. And we expect this to last about 15 to 20 minutes with some time at the end for general Q&A as well. So let's um, kick it off and we, you know, our families uh, communicate throughout our uh, support network and they find us in different times, but you know, a lot of people are finding us right in the NICU um, or right after discharge. And we know that there's just a lot of emotions um, that come, you know, from a NICU experience. Um, and, you know, obviously Jen and I have both been on the parent side of things um, and also, you know, see so many people talking about uh, you know, how impact, impacted they are from this experience um, at the beginning with their kids. Um, so I guess, Sue, let's, you know, let's talk through what some of the, you know, emotions that people, you know, feel um, after the NICU, you know, might be and how, um, you know, that might be, why that might be expected and what to do about it. Yeah, I think um, something you just said is very important is that many of these emotions are um, expected or usual. Um, I'm not sure if normal is the proper word, but if you as a parent are feeling any of these things, you're not alone. There's not anything wrong with you. It's certainly 100% normal to feel fear about your baby's future, to feel anxiety, to feel anger at what happened, um, to feel sadness at the loss of your dream of what your delivery and uh, experience with your newborn baby would look like. Um, so I think for parents, you're going to be cycling between all of these different emotions and different emotions may come to the forefront at different times based on what you're doing. But as those emotions come up, they really need to be kind of recognized. And I don't know if accepted is the right word, but it's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel sad. And in your experiences with your own support networks, you may find that there are people around you who don't want you to feel those feelings because it's uncomfortable for them to see you feeling sad or angry. And you may hear the message, you know, things are gonna be okay. Uh, let's get beyond this. Your baby's born, he or she is here, let's be happy. And that may not jive with how you are feeling. So uh, it may be that you need to set boundaries with your support network um, so that you can experience what you're experiencing and not feel guilty for these expected reactions. Absolutely. I mean, I know I can speak from personal experience. Um, 
leaving the NICU, you know, there's so much unknown. The wait and see is just a really difficult thing. Um, for me, you know, there, it just brought up so many questions far greater than what is my child's developmental trajectory going to be. Um, you know, it brought up questions about my relationship with my husband and, you know, the, you know, someone had thrown out a statistic about divorce, um, among, you know, families of children with disabilities. Um, it, you know, brought up, you know, could we, could I still have a career? I really enjoyed working. And then can we have more children because there's so many different causes of HIE, um, you know, and just a lot of those things, um, the HIE experience, you know, uh, while there are a lot of uh, kids that are born premature um, is primarily impacts full-term babies. And, um, you know, the, the emphasis on NICU and, and full-term versus preemie uh, can be a really uh, difficult wrench for a lot of our families who, you know, I mean, even just sharing that your child's in the NICU and then being met with, oh, well, they must be premature. And you're like, no, actually they're not. And they're, you know, like on life support and have a brain injury. <laughs> it's like, it's just a whole lot of things that, you know, you have to process that after you, you know, get discharged across all, um, you know, all different outcomes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, one of the issues that you're raising has to do with thinking about maybe not necessarily going ahead with reordering your priorities, but immediately after you get home with your baby, your priorities may have to shift from your thought of taking six weeks off of work or whatever to maybe staying home longer to give your baby the care that you feel he or she needs now. And then there's the whole question of long-term priorities and how having this baby growing into this child is going to affect the choices that you make. Uh, one thing I wanna do is to encourage all the parents out there to not feel pushed into uh, changing their priorities in a certain way if they don't want to. In other words, don't just immediately assume, oh, I got to give up my career. Everything is for my baby now. Um, research does show that parents who have children with disabilities tend not to continue their education, contend, um, tend not to go back to work as fully as perhaps they were intending to or as fully as they were before. And that's okay if that's what you choose, absolutely 100%, but it doesn't have to necessarily be that way. So don't look at your child um, as kind of a stone around your neck that is forcing your life to change in ways that you don't want it to. Try to stay open to um, all of the possibilities and figuring out a way that things can work for you as well as your family and your baby. A really good point. It just is such a um, pendulum shift and you have to look at all of those points. Um, and, you know, I think one of the questions that, you know, comes up too as we, um, as we do start to process is understanding that this has been a traumatic situation to go through and trauma and grief look very differently. Certainly, um, you know, there are families in our community who do not get to bring home their baby, um, and we have a lost community. Um, and I think people traditionally think of grief as just, you know, as, as, as loss of life, which is, I don't want to say just, that was the wrong word to send out there, but just like in that bubble. But in our community, grief is a continuum, and it has, um, you know, that loss of experience um, and that experience of, um, of trauma when it comes to that birth experience or that unexpected NICU experience. I don't think many people expect to be in the NICU, but in this situation in particular, um, it's a birth trauma that people have been through. Yes, the, the process of birth is experienced as traumatic by maybe as many as a third of all women just in general. And for women, of course, who have babies with HIE, I would imagine the number is far, far greater. So I think it's extremely important to a parent's healing 
to understand exactly what happened during their birth experience and why things went the way they went. Um, obviously, speaking on behalf of doctors, there's no physician, there's no obstetrician, midwife, or anything who wants to be a part of a bad outcome for a family. Everybody wants the best for mothers and babies. So whatever happened in your personal experience, I'm guessing it was related to some sort of emergency with how your baby was responding to labor or um, some condition perhaps the baby had before birth. But, um, you know, sometimes I know women are delivered by physicians who are not their primary physicians. Uh, that's sort of more and more common as hospitals hire laborists to work in the hospital to do the deliveries so private practice doctors don't have to come in. So you, you may have been delivered as I was actually with both of my children by somebody I never even met before. Um, and that can make it harder to get a good reading on your experience because you maybe see that person in the delivery room, maybe you see them at a follow-up visit while you're in the hospital, but maybe at your six week visit or earlier, if you go back, you see your own doctor if you have you know, a personal doctor. So I would encourage you to try to get with the person who delivered you to really understand what were the events leading to the decisions. And I know that, you know, having been on the neonatology side of things, I have certainly seen deliveries take place, you know, within five minutes from the obstetrician saying, we need to deliver this baby. And five minutes later, the baby's out. That doesn't give you as a parent any time to process. It hardly even gives you any time to consent or agree to what you're going to be put through. So you're feeling an extreme lack of control and um, you probably don't understand, you know, all the medical aspects of why this is necessary. So I think understanding your uh, personal experience in a way that you can tell your own story and sort of take it back for yourself instead of being a victim of something that happened to you is important in your healing. So I would encourage um, everyone out there to really try and understand what happened uh, so that there aren't as many hard feelings about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and, and there, I mean, there's so many stories, thousands of stories now that have been shared, uh, you know, in our community of, um, of, you know, just so many varied causes and, and situations. Um, it's, it's really, you know, really diabolical when you think about it, just everyone's story. I mean, for, for ours, you know, Max just stopped moving when I was 37 weeks pregnant. So he went in and, you know, was an emergency C-section. Um, and for me that asked the question of, you know, especially like what happens? So can we like, can I have more kids? Like what, you know, like, is that going to happen to future pregnancies, you know? Um, and luckily we were, um, you know, directed to a very compassionate um, maternal fetal medicine specialist to talk through and look at that afterwards. Cause that was important to me. My, you know, six week follow-up was um, with my primary OB gin. Um, and we, we knew obviously, you know, how he came out and it was, um, it was, you know, an emergency C-section. Uh, but, you know, when I had asked my primary OB Jin, like, what is, you know, what all these questions and he's like, I don't know, here's a card. <laughs> you know? It's like, you know, um, it was just really, it was really tricky to, um, you know, to, to navigate that. And I didn't feel like he was as compassionate about it. And he's like, look, he's like, look at him. He's fine. He's fine. He's going to be fine. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like, this is not validating any of my trauma that I just went through, you know? So, but I did find validation in going to the maternal fetal medicine physician who was just a wonderful person who will help me walk through a, a subsequent pregnancy and things like that. Well, I think in addition to your wanting to know of the medical part about what happened, mm -hmm. that parents have to um, confront the psychological part, the possible post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. um, it's very real. Um, it's 
definitely exists after birth. It may be terrifying. And that certainly may be a reason why uh, a person may not want to get pregnant again, just to go through this experience of delivery. I remember when I was a little girl, um, you know, thinking about babies getting born and then, you know, getting pregnant. And it was like, all babies have to come out. Like getting pregnant is one thing, but they all have to come out. You have to go through this process no matter what. And it can be terrifying and frightening mm -hmm. when you've had a previous experience. So if you are suffering from flashbacks or uh, just completely trying to block everything out of your memory of what happened, or you know, you're know you numb or certain things just trigger you like smelling hand sanitizer might bring you back to the delivery room. Mm -hmm. If you're experiencing those things, it's really worth your while to uh, get some professional help, uh, rely on your sisters in your support organization to try and work through those feelings before you approach you know, getting pregnant again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, and when we talk about how we heal moving forward um, and managing just those relationships out of the NICU, I mean, when we talk about, you know, relationships with partners and spouses and things like that, and, and even, you know, outside family who mean well and who might say things, um, you know, we had talked a little bit about this before, you know, everyone's journey is different, even the people that experience it in tandem together. I know for us, I needed to see someone right away to talk through the trauma. Um, it took my husband about five years to get to his point. We were on very different tracks on how we processed that experience. Um, and understanding that that is, you know, I think that's really hard for a lot of people sometimes to realize that your experience is your own and your partner might feel a totally different way. And both of you, how you're reacting is okay. You just have to find how you can best connect and support each other. And that's tricky. Um, and then, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, kind of you're in this bubble of experience um, and how the rest of the world, you know, experiences it, you know, I mean, I countless, countless posts from people in our community about people saying comments of they're fine, they're fine, they're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, like, you know, like just, it's, you know, it's not helpful. So like when Sue, when you talk about those boundaries, like, can you talk a little bit more about giving some advice of strategies, perhaps that people can look at to, you know, you don't want to also ostracize people that are supporting you, but it's, you know, like you got to find a good way to get that balance between that as well. Yeah, I think, I think one thing that's very um, difficult is when people tell you not to feel what you're feeling. That is really invalidating and it tends to cut you off from those people. Uh, one of the strategies that I think every that he should have in their repertoire, repertoire is just a statement that I'm not ready to talk about that right now. If some, somebody says, oh, you know, what happened? Or aren't you mad at your doctor? Or they did a terrible job or something like that. You can just say, you know what? I have a lot to process. I haven't done it yet. I'm not ready to talk about it. You know, when I'm ready, I will come to you. But please don't bring that up anymore. Um, and that takes practice because if you're not the type of person that is a direct communicator like that, <laughs> that is, that can be a very, I'm a, I'm a direct communicator. So, <laughs> but it has taken me practice over the years as well. When I come up against things where I'm like, that doesn't, that doesn't sit right with me. How do I communicate back that that is not, it's in conflict with, um, with being helpful, you know, yep. to hear those things. I think, um, you know, what you said is accurate that a lot of people will say, oh, don't worry, it's going to be fine. Um, a response to that might be, we are definitely hopeful that everything's going to be fine, but we can't help but worry a little bit about it. So, you know, I need space for that too. That's so strong and, and empowering, I feel, you know, the more that you can practice that too. Yeah, I think that even if you write down 
some things that people might say to you or people have already said to you and uh, think of a response that you can have ready because sometimes these things catch you at moments where you're liable to just dissolve into tears because you haven't you know figured out what your comeback is going to be but it, it's perfectly appropriate to protect yourself and go through your experience and your grief and your process at the rate and speed that you can it may not be at the rate and speed that your friends and your family want to uh, you to be at. Uh, another thing just to understand is um, grandparents in particular may be grieving themselves. They are grieving their hope for a perfect experience. They're grieving that you, their child, didn't get to have that perfect experience um, they're worried about you, and at the same time, it's hard for them to process all of their feelings. So they may want to just sweep everything under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was actually a conversation mm -hmm. I can distinctly remember with my mom, who is always very, very supportive. But right in the beginning, she said, um, you know, we had a lot of these difficult conversations and said, you know, and she said to me, she said, I have my own hopes and dreams for you as a mother and as a, you know, and that was like such a, you know, I think about that conversation often and how, you know, it wasn't a competition of, you know, there's so much of this, like, we talk about this in our community too, of like, you know, everyone's heart is hard. And like, you have to remember, like, you know, that there's, there, everyone has their own experience of your experience. Um, and where you can find common ground to move forward in a positive way with each other. Yeah, speaking of a positive way to move forward, you, you might even write a list of specific things that people can do to be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. Like, can you come over and do my laundry today while I take care of the baby? Can you bring me some meals? Can you go to the store and get what I need? Because people do want to feel helpful. Um, and so if you can direct them to how they can be helpful so that you can focus on your baby, that would be a good strategy as well. Absolutely. And, you know, most people want to like rush over and, you know, see the baby and see the baby. And it's like, you need to also be taken care of. Um, obviously with COVID times, things are weird right now where, you know, there's a whole different layer of grief. Um, and trauma behind, you know, a COVID HIE experience. Um, so, you know, and not, not necessarily having as much support potentially as you would in non-COVID times. Yeah, I think too, like in talking about emotional support, you know, when you talk about different types of communicators, I think sometimes, like we said, people want to say the right thing and try to fix the problem and try to help you look on the bright side. And that can feel really painful and dismissive, but I think it helps sometimes. Um, this is something that I've kind of learned with, with some of my close friends and also working with a therapist and trying to say, you know, okay, I have to talk about this and all I need is for you to listen. Like that, like kind of giving people the expectation of the conversation so that they know like, okay, I like, and even if somebody is sick coming to me, okay, do you need advice? Do you want advice from me? Or do you just need to vent? Like, and I think that that, that really helps too with those differences, you know, and kind of, you know, trying to figure that out, figure that communication out. That can help understanding where other people are coming from. In addition to not wanting to discuss difficult, painful topics and not knowing how to do that. Um, partners uh, may feel responsible for what happened to you and what happened to the baby. Even though, you know, logically speaking, partners aren't really responsible for probably much of anything that goes on in labor and delivery. Uh, just as the provider, you know, if we if we stick with stereotypical cultural roles, the provider, the partner in the relationship, 
feels responsible for you and it pains them to see you in pain. And sometimes they don't know how to deal with that and they feel that they've somehow let you down. And similarly, grandparents um, always want to protect their children know how, no matter how old their children are, like your mom speaking to you, Betsy. Um, we don't we don't like to see our kids suffer or hurt and so that that makes it difficult also for for us to um respond in ways that might be more helpful to you my mother used to say i don't want to answer the phone anymore because it's always something bad has happened <laughs> with one of the kids <laughs> it wasn't you know true it was just she just couldn't stand to hear any pain mm -hmm. in her family because it was painful to her. Absolutely. Yeah, so and then I think that kind of brings us to, you know, connecting um, with people who have similar experiences. And obviously, this is like the heart of who we are as an organization is connecting with um, other families. And just, um, you know, you've done, you've been a pioneer in, um, in leading so much research on showing the value of peer to peer support for families. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that work you've done. And, um, you know, we can kind of wrap up with, you know, obviously talking about hopes, different outlets as well, and why we've grown them the way we have. Well, somebody who's had a similar experience to you is going to be the best person to be able to understand it. You know, another mother who has struggled with worries and concerns about her baby and um, fear and anxiety about her delivery and so forth is going to be much better able to hear the things that you have to say than your mom or your sister or your best friend, possibly. It's possible, but um, I think that's where the real value of peer support comes in. Professionals, doctors, nurses, they can empathize with you. They can try to help you feel better, but they haven't been through the same experience that you have to know how it really affects you deeply on a personal level, such as a peer mentor would be able to. Now, a peer mentor isn't going to be able to replace the type of support you would get from any type of professional. They're not going to be able to replace um, a therapist, for example, in helping you get through PTSD, but they provide a different kind of support. Uh, you may even find that talking with your peer mentor enables you to go to therapy, supports you in that process, because that can be a scary process as well. You have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to go through everything that happened, talk about it, um, and that, that can be difficult. So peer supporters have a special role to play. Um, and as well, the other benefit is that relationships between peer mentors and your parents can last for a long time and can provide a type of consistency that you can't necessarily find in the medical world. Um, you may have you know, this doctor and that doctor and different people who help you with different things, but a peer support person can stick with you for months and even longer than that to um, help you walk through your journey. Absolutely, you know, and that's something obviously we've uh, started connecting um, and have built out, you know, in so many different facets to try to meet the needs of our community um, in all the different ways, you know, trying to balance being a parent in this unexpected journey um, and connecting with others that can, you know, can commiserate and, you know, kind of light that path ahead for you. Um, and illuminate and bring up different, um, you know, things. And, and we talk about this a lot too, like, you know, there's this, there's this taking care of you and there's this parenting and you need all of it, <laughs> you need all of that help, right? Um, and, you know, part of the parenting piece is even understanding what questions to ask. Um, and I think that can be said for the mental health part too, where, you know, like, where do I even begin? Or I've, you know, there's stigma, there has been stigma around mental health. Um, and around taking medications for mental health conditions and things like that. And, you know, 
I think we try to do a, a good job as a community of busting those down and saying, you gotta, you gotta do what works for you to find that peace and to find yourself. Um, and, you know, we, we acknowledge the experience of all sorts of different family dynamics. So married, um, LGBTQ, um, the, you know, race and ethnicity and, um, you know, single parenting and just all sorts of different dynamics. You know, we are, HIE impacts everyone. It does not discriminate against who it impacts. Um, and so we've tried to intentionally build our communities um, to be able to connect in those, in those unique ways, focusing on self-care and mental health and have a place just for dads and, you know, things like that, because those experiences we know are so unique. Um, and and the, the value that can come out of that is, you know, that knowledge exchange in that, um, you know, that positive connection that you can build with someone else. Yeah, another thing is about resources. So peer mentors who are a couple of steps ahead of you in their journeys um, have come across a lot of resources that may be helpful to parents just starting their journey. So mm -hmm. having a peer mentor is totally not just about commiserating or you know, have someone to listen to you moan about your situation. It's about supporting your resilience. And uh, as you said, serving as a light, guiding where you're going. Um, it's somebody to help help you cope in a positive way, not not just listen to you complain without um, saying they don't want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Well, that um, thank you so much, Sue, for all of this incredible um, insights that you bring to our uh, medical advisory board and our community. Um, and just the work that you've done, uh, you know, really, again, showcasing the importance of, you know, parent mental health, um, you know, with NICU experiences. Um, it is just, uh, it, it's exciting to see where it has gone over the past few years and how recognized um, it is now more widely um, and, you know, and how much work still needs to happen, but um, mm -hmm. that it has, um, you know, we're, we're getting families that are into our network that have you know, far more connection resources than, than have, you know, when I first joined eight years ago. And that, that's really the goal is to just always continue to, you know, see how we can um, best support families and work with, um, you know, with NICU providers and uh, PICU providers to, um, to make sure that, you know, I, I say this a lot, like, you know, kids and babies, they can't raise themselves. So they need, <laughs> they need healthy parents and healthy caregivers to um, help them get through and, and reach their own potential. Um, and, you know, the, the old um, saying of putting on your own oxygen mask is sometimes nearly feels impossible um, before you help someone else, but it is absolutely necessary to prioritize yourself in, um, in this journey to, to get yourself as healthy as you can be. You deserve it. Everyone deserves to feel good and enjoy you know, life, <laughs> um, even when it's really hard. Yes, the um, rates for postpartum depression and post-traumatic stress disorder are at least two times higher in NICU parents of any genre. We're not just mm -hmm. talking about preemie parents. So knowing that you've had a baby in the NICU uh, should alert you to the fact that you're really high risk to experience any of these um, mental health complications, if you want to call it. And postpartum depression is actually the number one complication of childbearing. It's not a medical thing like hemorrhage or high blood pressure or anything like that. It's depression, the number one complication. So you are totally not alone, but it's Betsy's point about having parents be healthy so that they can bond with their children and provide the best experience for their children is really what it's all about. Uh, we're looking out for the babies by looking out for the moms, so. Absolutely. All right, um, 
I know there's been a ton of comments going on in the um, in the chat, which is so wonderful to see people connecting. And I see people responding to each other, which is really great and commiserating. Um, and so, you know, feel free to drop any questions you have right now. We'll wrap it up. Um, I haven't seen any come through that really haven't been um, unanswered. But, you know, the best thing about this is you can come back to this video, you can add more questions, and we can always elevate them afterwards. Um, and so just keep using that. Um, you know, we have some resources that we have shared. Um, oh, Lisa, Lisa Ledson, she's one of our um, super, <laughs> super involved um, Hope for HIE volunteers and, um, and parents um, said she wishes the focus in the NICU could be that of how are the parents but, you know, can parents be assigned daily counseling and guidance in the NICU? And this is something that we just talked about. We're adding a NICU psychologist to our medical advisory board. And we just talked to her, Jen and I did just before this meeting. Um, and this is a newer area that, um, you know, we have social workers, but, um, you know, in NICUs typically, but, you know, as far as the, the general experience of our families, it's articulated more that those social workers are connecting you to community-based resources and are not necessarily providing that parent mental health that are, that are needed. So the National Perinatal Association started kind of a movement a number of years ago, promoting the involvement of psychologists in the NICU. And probably since 2015, um, I'm guessing the number of psychologists has doubled or tripled in NICUs. Primarily, you're going to see psychologists in large academic medical center NICUs, you know, the ones that have 60 and 80 and 100 beds. Um, but we uh, collectively, National Perinatal Association, and now there's a group offshoot called um, NICU um, Psychologists, something like that. There's probably 20 or 30 of them in that group. And we continue to lobby, um, if you will, with hospitals to provide behavioral and mental health services to families, even if they don't have a full-time dedicated psychologist because the NICU is too small. We're encouraging them to connect with um, community providers. And one of the ideas that I've been talking up is um, if NICUs would contract with psychologists to provide tele-mental health. Mm -hmm. So it would be so great if they could say, um, on Tuesdays, Tuesday afternoons, we have a psychologist who's available by Zoom. And if you would like an appointment or, you know, we recommend that you have an appointment, um, this is available to you. When psychologists mm -hmm. are in the NICU, they try to talk to all parents so that it's not like we picked you out, you need help. It's like everybody who's in the NICU is under stress. Everybody could benefit from talking to someone. And so we offer this to everyone, so. Mm -hmm. That's amazing, just to, so so people can know that these are the issues that can come up. And these are the feeling, like you said, the feelings that are you know, often experienced, just that alone, to have that information while mm -hmm. you're still in the NICUs would yeah, be amazing. Yeah. I will put in a plug for um, Postpartum International, Postpartum Support International, they actually have an online NICU parent support group. Um, so, so that's an option if anybody's looking you know, for more of a mental health uh, mm -hmm. approach to the NICU experience. I um, definitely think that the majority of people are probably going to be parents of preemies. But that's another thing, uh, working with the NICU parent network is that we're trying to get everyone to understand that it's not just preemies who need support, preemie parents, they seem to get all the attention. So that's why I was so thrilled to see your organization start and why I have been promoting it is that we need to really provide the same level of support to all mm -hmm. kinds of parents, not just preemie parents. Absolutely. 
I mean, obviously that's been a big advocacy point for us as well <laughs> over the past few years. And, you know, I think when we have started talking too, um, and we did join um, this past year, the NICU Parent Network, and they used to be called the Preemie Parent Network and rebranded, um, which I'm so grateful for. And I've had, you know, we had conversations as a board with um, their uh, president as well, um, just about, you know, that emphasis. And, and that is part of their strategy of growth is to make sure that they are being inclusive in that, you know, and that, you know, I've talked to, um, there was a referral that came through a couple of weeks ago from another um, NICU uh, parent support organization. And, um, you know, and she's like, you know, we, we do preemies really well. And, you know, we're going to refer this HIE parent to um, someone who is an aunt to an HIE child. And I was like, no, just you know, like bring them on over. <laughs> like, you know, it's so important to get the, that right connection right in. Um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, that it's all about that relationship building because, you know, the more that we can talk about things like this, um, the better people are going to get connected. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, it's exciting to hear of referral patterns changing, um, when, you know, for parents, when they get discharged with their child from the NICU of, um, of what kind of, you know, mental health support they can get tied into right away. Um, that is so important. I think there's so much opportunity there um, with health systems to, you know, contract with uh, local providers to, to get to. And then the advent of telehealth, now that co one of the positives of COVID yeah. is making it so much more accessible than it ever was before. And it's forcing a lot of the coverage that was lacking prior to push it to this level, which we see in many different ways, you know, telehealth can, can be a barrier, but it can be so good in certain regards uh, for our families. And I think mental health wise is certainly one that, um, that can be a very big positive for our families to get access to that kind of care. Well, thank you so much, Sue, for all you do, for all of your incredible work in this arena, for, you know, being a part of our medical advisory board. Jen, thank you so much for your work and bringing, you know, all of this together. Um, and my last thank you to Medtronic for um, being a, an important partner for us to be able to bring this series to our community. We're really excited. Um, everyone today, thank you for joining us. And again, we'll continue the dialogue as we move forward. And we're excited to bring you more programs like this moving forward. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.